Welcome to the Trade Up Podcast, Episode 2. This week, Whitney South, her journey from journalism to welding and her passion for both. The Trade Up Podcast is inspired by the book, Trade Up, Why Buy a Job When You Can Start a Career, written by John Finan and me, Lisa Brandt. Here's John Finan. Well, Lisa, I um, had the opportunity to chat with a young woman who left the career she loved to train for a trade that she also loves. Whitney South was, still is, an entertainment journalist, but she does it on the side now, along with being a full-time welder. That is so cool. I got to know Whitney a little bit when she worked for Our London. I used to write a column for them, and she is out and about at music events. She's a terrific photographer and interviewer. And she didn't tell everybody that she became a welder for a long time. Well, now she's passionate about welding, and she actually says that welding and journalism have some very common themes between them. Ah, who knew? Well, let's hear it. Whitney South with John Finan, From Journalism to Welding. Well, it's actually even more complicated than going from journalism to welding. So originally, I planned on just being a photographer, and that's what I went to school for. I went to art school at the Ontario College of Art and Design. And then I graduated and worked at Starbucks for 10 years. I decided that I wanted to do more than just photography. I wanted to write as well. So I'm not going to say how old I was when I got to journalism school, but it was later. Um, Took journalism at Conestoga College, got a job at the Cambridge Times right out of school, moved on to Seaforth, ended up in London working for Our London, which was an entertainment-based newspaper magazine hybrid. It was the best job. It was just the best job. I got to interview musicians, artists, and local as well as visiting. And then we got closed in the big baseball card swap between Tour Star, uh, Metroland Media, and Sun Media. So from there, I ended up freelancing for about five years, um, working with a bunch of clients all over London and beyond, record labels across the country. And then the pandemic hit. Hmm. And being totally immersed in entertainment journalism, where I didn't have anything to write about. Right. Yeah, Uh, it's kind of dead. So let me just understand this. So you finished high school and you want to be a photographer. And what was it about photography that drew you to that career? Honestly, it was kind of an accident. Of course. I went to the same school as my peer group, like my entire life. And then all of a sudden I needed like one extra credit. So I went to a totally different school where I could take photography class. I had to have three classes. Hmm. So I thought I would take a photography class. And I had this amazing teacher named Miss Mamaliti. And I just became obsessed. And we learned on film, completely manual cameras. And it was just an incredible experience. And I thought, I really want to do this. So what went kind of from art, graphic design, didn't really know what I wanted to do into photography. And that's what I applied for OCAD with was my photography portfolio. And that's what I got into. Interesting. Okay. So this was a throwaway course that turned into a career trajectory. Absolutely. Which is so bizarre because I actually lied to get into the class. Uh Oh, (laughs) what do you have to lie about to get into a photography class? So originally um, I was looking at the catalog and I said, oh, you have a graphic design course. And they said, well, have you ever taken a graphic design course before? And I said, no, but I've, I've worked at a graphic design studio. Like I'm very familiar with the software and everything. They said, no, no, you'd have to start at the grade 10 level. Well, I'm in OAC. I don't want to do that. So I'm looking through the catalog and I see photography and I said, oh, photography. What about that? They said, well, have you ever taken a photography course before? Yes, many, lots. <laughs> never. I had never in my life, but I didn't want to start at, you know, grade 10 level. Um, yeah. Got into the class, bought my first manual camera. I just kind of observed what everybody else was doing, asked some questions, got a 98 on my first project confessed to Miss Mamaliti I'd never taken a course before. She's like, well, I can't kick you out because clearly you're good at it. So yeah, it occurs to me that there's not a lot of difference between taking photos and developing them and a trade. Did that strike you as maybe you're back to where you started? I don't know. I just, I guess I never thought about that. I guess when I did take photography and it was developing the film and the paper and everything else was very hands-on. So yeah, maybe. 
maybe okay. I'm a hands-on kind of person. Well, we're going to get into your welding in a bit, but it seems to me that welding is a lot of, I mean, I'm sure what you do, and we'll get into that in more detail, you've got to follow some blueprints and you've got to make sure it meets some specifications. But it seems to me that a lot of welding has got a lot of artistic uh, flair to it. So yeah, maybe there was something to that. That's how you came to decide on that. So you spend a few years doing that. You come out of college and then I'm um, presumably you've got, you know, needs to get a, a job and make some money. You've, maybe you've got some student debt and then you end up at Starbucks. So you're not in Seaforth anymore, I guess. Oh no, Seaforth, that, that goes with journalism. Ah, gotcha. With, okay. uh, with Starbucks, that was kind of right out of high school and through college and, and all okay. that kind of stuff. That actually took me out to BC when I came back from BC is when I got into journalism when I was in my thirties. Okay. Gotcha. And it was because the photography just wasn't going to pay all the bills. It wasn't even that. It's that I wanted to tell stories with my photos. I didn't want to just take art photos. I wanted to kind of do a photo journalistic kind of thing. And in order to do that, because newspapers rarely have just photographers and just writers anymore, you have to do both. Right. That's why I went to journalism school is to get the writing part. Gotcha. And how long were you in school for journalism? Two years. Okay. Was it two years of photography? Oh, no, it was five. Five years of photography. Okay. For fine arts, thesis in photography, fancy pants stuff there. Well, you know what? That makes sense because if a picture's worth a thousand words, that does make sense that you would spend more time on the photography side of it than the writing side of it. So I'm, I'm up to speed on that. So you finish grade 12, but you want to um, tell stories. So you're in two years of journalism school, which is probably some writing, but probably learning more about the techniques of doing interviews and fact checking and that sort of thing. Is that right? Oh, we had all sorts of classes. So there was uh, opinion writing classes. We actually also took broadcast in our first year. So have a little bit of radio knowledge, not much. Interview skills, research skills. We had an ethics and journalism course, just all aspects. And we had a photography course, which was hilarious. And I didn't tell my teacher that I had a background in photography. <laughs> For somebody that's uh, going to make a living telling stories about the truth, you kind of keep a lot of things hidden. So uh, just I'm a little sneaky. personal yeah. observation there. But OK, so you're 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 taking pictures and you're writing stories about musical groups, which and the entertainment industry, which frankly sounds like a ton of fun for somebody that's likely at the age that you were. And and had it not been for the pandemic and the shutdown of that, would you have seen yourself continuing along those lines? Oh, absolutely. I loved working for my paper. Don't get me wrong. But every year after that, I kept getting more clients. I kept getting to do cooler things every single year. I was set up to have my best year ever. So things kind of come to a, I'm guessing, a screeching halt. And you're probably sitting at home like most of us were thinking about what the heck am I going to do? Am I going to wait this out? And how do you come to the decision that you're going to look for another career? And then how did you come to choose a trade? Well, it was kind of a strange process that involved Facebook, believe it or not. So I was actually interested in welding as an art form when I was in art school. But because I was in photography, like we had two streams, we had arts and design. Right. And photography was, I believe, part of the design stream and we weren't allowed to cross streams. So I couldn't do welding and photography, but I kind of always wanted to do welding. I don't, I don't know what it was, but as an art form, it just seemed really neat to me. And so sitting there in the pandemic, as we all were, I go on Facebook and I say, do I know any girl welders I'm from yep. high school who I legitimately had not spoken to since high school, send me a link for a welding program at Conestoga college in Waterloo, six month government subsidized program. They take, I think it was about 25 kids right. or people in general. And I got in. Actually a parallel there. I got into the electrical trade much the same way. And, and I reached out to somebody that I hadn't reached out to since high school. Now, fair enough, no Facebook back then, but so you're at Conestoga college. Was it all women that were in this program or everybody? 25 in the class, four of us. were. Ah, uh, right. So my guess is that there's probably more as a percentage of the total, more women in your class of welders than there is in the career of welding. Is that right? Oh, I'd say it's where I work. It's about the same kind of percentage. Okay. We're a small bunch, but um, yeah, it was about the same. So four out of 25. Yeah, I'd say it was about the same percentage where I work. Okay. Oh, good. Unless I see more ladies getting into the 
trades and specifically into welding that's that's not one that i would necessarily jump out and and uh, think okay that's one that's more suited to women i don't think there is a trade that's more suited to women although you know having watched flash dance in the 80s i mean i'm a little bit biased i suppose and did you know about that movie when you got into the yes as an 80s baby i was very familiar the first thing my dad sent to me when he found out i was going to do welding was flash dance and i've heard it 50 million times at this point. <laughs> but your dad said it first, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, gotcha. I like that guy. How long was the class? The class was six months. Yep. And then you're certified at the end of that? Well, we did uh, We did get our tickets for two different uh, welding styles, but it was a pre-apprenticeship program. So okay. there was no straight up certification. Ah, gotcha. But you can work in the trade. Yeah. Kind gotcha. of like beginner level pre-apprenticeship, learn how to weld. I'd never touched a welding machine in my life or my first day of school. And you know, on the first day of school, you always go and they read the syllabus and maybe it's like a half day and you just kind of like write your stuff on your notebooks. I didn't expect to be touching a welding machine that first day. Right into it. Oh yeah. Full on. And I was just, I was totally freaked out. Interesting. (laughs) Okay. Logically prepared for that. And are y'all in the same room? 25 of you? Yes, we did. Our classes were actually on Zoom. We had a math class and a computer class. Right. There's a lot of theory involved and blueprint reading. All of those things were via Zoom. And then we were all together in the shop. But we were all, it was COVID. So we were all wearing respirators. We were all separated, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Welders have a lot of PPE on anyway. So you're probably halfway there just to start off with. Of your classmates, had anybody had any experience in welding to any degree? Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of the the students were kids um, who were coming straight out of high school who had done welding in shop or even at home or their parents were welders or so there were people that had experience. And then there was myself and my friend Gabby and this gentleman, Mark. So Mark came from a graphic design background and Gabby was a math teacher actually in the States. So the three of us, we had no welding experience whatsoever. We were kind of the older ones in the class. Okay. Now, when you say older, so Mark and Gabby, how old would they have been? No, you don't have to say how old you are. <laughs> oh, I just have to can... throw them under the bus. Yeah, Gabby um, for sure. And Mark. I believe Gabby was in, I'd say mid, mid thirties, maybe early thirties. And then Mark okay. was in his fifties, mid fifties. So career changes for, well, she was a teacher, of course, and he was a graphic design guy. So I'm guessing he hadn't done his graphic design his entire whole career. Sounds like he's kind of closer to my age and maybe that wasn't even a thing for him in the beginning. Yeah, he he and I kind of talked a little bit because he was a graphic designer in media. So we were kind of like, oh, look, we were in media and now we are here. <laughs> uh, uh, that's interesting how you kind of came back. And everybody else was much younger, I'm guessing. So under 25. Yeah. Mostly, yeah. 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 Now, the program that you took, did it specifically tie itself to a job path afterwards? As in, at the end of these six months, I know I'm going to get a job and it's likely to be at one of these four facilities. Well, it was actually um, part of the program was at the end, you had to get a job to kind of graduate the program. So they helped us build our resumes and talk about interviews and, and all that kind of stuff. And how long after you finished your program was it before you got your first uh, paycheck? My first paycheck? or Well, I wow. started, so I finished my program uh, right before Christmas, and I started at my current job on January 31st. So you didn't have any real downtime wondering if you'd made the right decision getting into welding. You knew right off the bat you had a job set up. Well, I so I was a little bit different because I was out of town. So everybody else was kind of from the KW area. And they were almost placed in job opportunities. Like we had certain employers come into the Zoom and talk to us and take the resumes and whatnot. Because I was out of town, I was kind of on my own as far as finding a job. I kind of applied traditionally like you would to a normal job instead of being through school. Let's face it. You got a job during COVID. Like, I mean, COVID was still a thing. Is this January 2022 or 2021? Would have been 2022. Yeah. Okay. So just to put a point in it for some people, that was the month, January was the month that the province of Ontario was shut down. Like all of our staff were gone that month. And I'm not even sure we were back the 31st of January. We may have gone on a little bit longer. It might've been like January 8th to February 8th. You know, COVID kind of went away and then it came back and then went away, you know, like one of those things. 
So good for you. That's quite amazing. So walk us through a day. What does, uh, you know, your career look like from the time you get to your work until you leave? And what do you do? And how do you like it? Well, I get up at four o'clock in the morning. Ooh. And then I commute to Woodstock. So um, I work for Tiger Cat Industries in Woodstock. We build forestry machines. And basically, I'll come in and we'll have a meeting with our team lead. And she'll tell us what machines we're making that day. We make three different machines in my area. And we get our blueprints and we get our assignments and we start building. Hang on. Can't stop uh, or go past that without stopping. Your team leader is a female. Yes. Okay. So... How does that come to be? Has she been welding before? How did she <laughs> What do you mean? How does that come to be? So my team lead, she's she's been a welder for a very long time. She comes to Ontario from Alberta. She's a red seal welder. Right. Uh, it's been her entire career, her whole life. Excellent. Good. So probably a good role model for young people that are looking to get into the trades. Mm-hmm. I know you hadn't gone through a traditional apprenticeship yourself, so the red seal wouldn't be something that you would have, but the Red Seal is is exactly uh, the reason she was able to come from Alberta to Ontario. Um, Welding is a compulsory trade, so when you go through the apprenticeship, if you uh, if you get certain marks, and frankly most do, you'll get a Red Seal certificate with your um, certificate of qualification, which allows you to work in pretty much every province. So you get your work assignments, and you get up at four. But what time do you clock in? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Okay, and then off to your work spot. And are you working on a different part of each machine each day or are you working on the same thing there's like four different stations and then there's different people that make roofs so i work on whatever my station is for whatever the machine is that we're building that day so like i said we build three different kinds of machines so parts would be different depending on what machine we're building and it would depend on if we're doing kind of the primary racks or the secondary racks of the machines okay you got a blueprint and you've got specifications. So I'm guessing you're really just following the recipe for what you're building. Is that true? Ideally, yes. Ideally, you get your parts and you get your blueprints and you weld it where it's supposed to be welded and you put it together where it's supposed to be put together. But it's never that cut and dry. Mm. It's measuring, it's math, it's all sorts of things, all sorts of things can go wrong. Nothing is, you know, perfect. Something isn't going to be bent perfect every single time and you have to make it fit. Maybe you have to grind pieces off to make it fit. There's a lot more to it than just say like a line welder where you're just welding the same part. This is more like you're taking four hours to build a piece that has maybe 15 different parts and they all have to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle with the perfect measurements, the right nuts, the right pieces. So you're crafting it from scratch, at least that portion of the machine. Basically. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So how do you like it? Oh, I love it. It was actually just two years, a couple of weeks ago. Right. It's so incredibly different, but the same as something like journalism. I mean, you're using your brain every single day in both jobs. You are exercising a muscle in both jobs. I kind of like, there's so many things about working in a trade versus being a freelance journalist, like I get paid every two weeks now. <laughs> yeah. It's important. I have benefit. I have coworkers. I used to make jokes when I was freelancing. Um, I would take a picture of my bubble bath with a wine glass and I'd say company Christmas party, <laughs> stuff like that. So the camaraderie is kind of cool. Um, doing different things all the time is cool. They say that being a journalist is like having homework 24 hours a day, seven days a week until you die. Oh, that doesn't sound like fun. Welding, in my particular case, I get to go to work and I get to work and I get to accomplish a ton in eight and a half hours. And then I get to go home and have a work-life balance. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm I'm guessing at the end, you see the product. So forestry equipment. So I'm guessing similar to bulldozers. But what I'm getting at is that you see small pieces of probably heavy metal, but, you know, small pieces, you weld them together. And at the end of the day, maybe the end of the week, something very big that's going to last and go out into the world and do work for many years is done. Is that true? Kind of because, well, every plant, so every tiger cat plant kind of does something different. So we in Woodstock, we do a lot of the welding. Our pieces then go to cleaning, they go to glass, they go to paint, and then they get assembled, and then they get sent to another plant where they get added to more pieces to finally build the giant machine. Ah, got ya. I actually finally got to go to Paris 
a couple of weeks ago and see the completed machines. Got to sit in one, see the joysticks and everything. It was so cool. To be able to walk around the machine and see my parts. Okay. We're not talking Paris, Ontario. We're talking you're driving down the Champs Elysees with one of these things. Is that right? No, Paris, Ontario. Paris, Ontario. Yeah, Paris. I was getting excited for you. I thought there was a big overseas trip to see one of these things. Okay, got it. Paris, Ontario is quite nice. So I was in the real Paris in August, but that was not welding related. Okay, gotcha. (laughs) I don't know why I thought that might have been true, but you had me going. You're a really good storyteller. So you got to you got to see the thing. How did that make you feel to see that? And did you look at the parts that you put on? Could you see them? Oh, I felt like such a nerd. I was so excited to walk in and see this just monster machine. And they're they're trying it out and they're moving the hydraulics. And I was able to walk around the machine and actually like point to pieces that I made. Yeah, they're painted and now part of this big, giant, amazing it was it was really really cool and i felt like such a nerd like because you always joke about people who are really into cars or whatever and then they see a really cool car and they get all dorky about it yep that's kind of my thoughts that's nice take pictures i did okay good well then yeah well of course you did you're a photographer looking back would you have changed anything would you have gone from photography to journalism to starbucks and into welding or would you done it in a different order that's a really hard question. I mean, I've I've thought about my path so many times. If I hadn't worked for Starbucks, I hadn't have met some people who are still my best friends. I would have never lived out west. I would have never volunteered for the Olympics because I wouldn't have been living in Vancouver. If I hadn't chosen to come back, I never would have gotten into journalism. With journalism, I got to do so many amazing things. Like things that you, I would never imagine. I, I flew a plane. I went into a burning building with firefighters training. Wow. Like I just, I got to speak to some of like my favorite musicians and artists in the world because of journalism. Yeah. And now because of welding, I'm just finding another whole joy in my life and working with my hands and finding out I can do all these things that I never, I've always sat behind a desk. I've sat behind a desk for like 15 years. Yeah. I never thought that I would be in a trade. I never thought that I would be building things or using grinders or torches or cutting things with plasma or any of the other cool things that I've gotten to do. So there's no way to say if I would change anything because my life's been a crazy weird ride and I can't can't even imagine changing anything. Sounds like fun. And it sounds like you could probably still do some journalism on the side with your welding. Is that is that something that's possible? Oh Oh, I do. Excellent. And still get to meet rock stars and rub noses with the elites of the music world. The first year that I welded, I still freelanced full time because I was so paranoid that I would fail at mm-hmm. welding. Hmm. Then last year, I kind of dialed it back a little bit to the point where I wasn't looking for anything anymore. And now this year, I have been approached by a whole bunch of contracts that I actually have decided to take on. And I missed writing so much that I've actually thrown my hat in the ring with an entertainment publication online called Swamp.ca. They're a music publication. So I'm moving forward, going to start kind of contributing to their website. So I missed it so much writing and and all that good stuff. So So you'll have to get up earlier than 4 a.m. or stay up later than you normally would go to bed. One of the two. It's the only way. No, weekends. (laughs) Right. I guess that's when a lot of the good music stuff happens. So I don't want to keep you forever, but I do want to ask has your perception of the trades changed since you've gone down this journey? And if it has, how, and is it something you would suggest to young people? I can't say it's changed because I've always had mad respect for people in trades. And I think that when you look at white collar and blue collar, I think that we always look at each other as though the grass is greener on the other side. And we don't truly appreciate what we do ourselves. I know that when I started talking to the guys at the shop, they were all like, why would you leave journalism to do this? And meanwhile, I'm like, you don't understand how amazing this is, Mm. how envious I am of you guys who've been doing this your whole lives. And you can build stuff and you can renovate stuff. And just to have those skills is so amazing. Mm. I think we all need to be kinder to ourselves and what we do. And just because it's what we do doesn't make it boring and doesn't make what someone else does better. No, that's a good point. We need to create the skills that we have 
because everyone else appreciates the skills that we have, even if we don't. We all have these special talents and we all just need to be kinder and appreciate what we can do. Well, it sounds like the talents that you have, Whitney, you've worked on. I mean, not just photography and journalism, but welding. They're all things that you, you know, you're not only a passion about in the beginning, but you probably struggled. So to do two jobs full time in the first year because you didn't think you would make it in welding just sort of speaks to that. You know, you had the tenacity to stick with it. And I'm guessing in the beginning, you didn't feel you were welding as good as you could and weren't welding as, as well as you are now. So good for you. So one final question. So I'm curious about your perception of females in the trades and that is shadowed at all by the fact that you're one of, well, you're, it's it, mathematically, I think you're about 15% females where you currently work. And, and would that change how you would give advice to young ladies that might consider the trades? There is one thing I would change if I was 19 again. Okay. I would never go to university for art. <laughs> <laughs> I just came off that student loan recently. Anyway, jokes. But, um, so when I went into the program at Conestoga College, I actually had to have an interview, like a job interview, to be considered to be in the class. And one of the things that the coordinator asked me was, so um, welding is predominantly men. Your class is going to be predominantly men. How does that make you feel? And I said, every newsroom I've worked in has been predominantly men. Every photo pit that I've ever been in has been predominantly men. That's just life. And it doesn't matter to me, if that makes any sense. You know, and it makes perfect sense. And I'm, and I'm not sure that a 19-year-old would have had the insight to say that. Not sure that they wouldn't, but not sure that they, most wouldn't, for sure. So good for you. It's just, it's kind of a little bit of a frustrating question, just because it's 2024, right? And if a woman wants to go be a carpenter, just go be a carpenter. Yeah. If you want to be a plumber, go be a plumber. If you want to be an electrician, go be an electrician. This isn't the 1800s. You know, yeah. if you have the skills, if you want to work hard, and you have developed the skills or you already have some skills, just do it. Don't be afraid of, of being, like I said, the only girl in the newsroom versus the only girl in the welding shop. It's the same thing. It's kind of a universal situation. That's so, great advice, you know, for us and, and on Whitney, which is, you know, don't be afraid, just go do it. That applies for anybody, men, women. Thanks for that insight. And I appreciate you spending the time chatting with us. Whitney South is a full-time welder and a part-time music journalist. Check out her Instagram for some of her gorgeous concert pictures. Her handle is Writer Winston. And read her music stories at swamp.ca. That's swamp, S-W-O-M-P dot C-A. Thanks for listening to the Trade Up Podcast. John Finan and I will be back in a couple of weeks with a fresh new episode. If you'd like to give feedback or suggest a future guest, email john at john at tradeupbook.com. I'm Lisa Brandt. Ciao.